will pray. Thank you, Lord, for this time of the day. As we meditate upon your words, be with us, guide us, guide us with your divine wisdom, Lord. Let your words be rooted deep in our hearts and let us act accordingly, which would glorify you, Lord. This we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 I think like you are all now aware of the missing Malaysian Airlines, MH370. Today will be the second week. They are just looking into for the missing aircraft. When I've been looking into this message, something was so interesting and fascinating to me about the aircraft. There is a component of the aircraft or a unit, they call that as the auxiliary power unit. This auxiliary power unit, it gives the power to the whole aircraft in the sense it is more vital and it is considered as an indispensable or an integral part of the plane. Just because it is powering the whole plane, it powering all the gadgets, the navigational gadgets, apart from all these, this auxiliary power unit, it gives power to the propeller, either be a twin engine or a three engine, this auxiliary power unit not only gives power to the plane, but it provides the vital power for the propeller to thrust the plane into the air for which it was made. Without the auxiliary power, this plane would be a lame duck. And when I was thinking about our prayer life, <clears throat> if the auxiliary power unit is so vital to an aircraft, our prayer life is so indispensable in our Christian walk of life. You all know and you will all agree that prayer is so indispensable and vital in our life. If so, how is your personal prayer time? How do you pray? <clears throat> do you do that as a duty? Do you just rush in and out? Or do you do that as a ritual? Or is it just plain talking in the air as an option? Are you doing the prayer with the right attitude and motive? If the attitude and the motive is right, is it so significantly incorporated into our lives? Are you praying earnestly and fervently? Is that prayer generating a spiritual power? That's the question. Today let us examine how our prayer life is. I would like to tell you like there are some commitments in our prayer life. The first thing, we need to focus reverently on the privilege of prayer. I'll repeat that again. To focus reverently on the privilege of prayer. What does that mean? See, as believers in Christ, we are awesomely privileged to live in an intimacy with God. That intimacy is a warm relationship with our Heavenly Father. That is the relationship our Father is desiring. 
if desire is not only to have a personal relationship, but it is more than that. The question here is, <clears throat> is he so intimate to you or he is so distant from you? See, when you want to know a person, you try to talk with him so frequently, you meet him frequently, and then you come to know more about that person, right? If our relationship on this earth is based on that, how far our frequency and intimacy it should be with our Heavenly Father. <clears throat> he says like, I, you abide in me and I in you. So the question here is, are you available for him to meet him, to listen to him? Are we wise enough to obey him? See, he's willing to guide you. But again, the question is, are we cooperating with him? The second commitment would be <clears throat> pursue gratefully the audience to God. Pursue gratefully the audience to God. Again, awesomely privileged. We have to be so grateful that our Heavenly Father is readily available whenever we call Him. Any moment, any moment of the day, He is never off limits. <clears throat> he is always engaged, but He is not neglecting our calls. See, when I sometimes call people, I would say, like, is this a good time to talk to you? I think, like, if the person on the other end is busy, would say, like, oh, Arun, you could call me after 10, time, 10 minutes, half an hour, or probably you can call me tomorrow, or the line would be engaged, wherein I could not even talk. But God is not like that. He's readily available to you. You have the direct access to the authoritative person of this whole universe. The question here is, are you in constant connection with him? The first question I put was, are you in intimate relationship with him? And here, are you in constant connection with him? Prayer is a time that we draw close to Him. It is the time we seek His will and His guidance. The Lord hears us and He answers our prayers. But He takes His own time and according to His divine wisdom, He provides us. Sometimes, we do not agree with most of his answers. It's human nature to doubt God at times. I think you all agree with that. But still, God doesn't give up. I will put it into so simple words like, prayer is not getting God conformed to us, but we conform to God. Most of the time when we pray to God, asking Him to do what we want Him to do for us, but I think like it should be the other way around, right? In the sense, prayer is done His way to His glory. If we pray regularly, in a proper way, with all the faith, it will help us to shine with the light of His glory in our day-to-day -day interactions with other people.
<coughs> if our vertical ventilation is proper with him, our horizontal relationship with our fellow beings will have no snag at all. But in spite of all these things, like, you know, like, most of the time, or some of the time, our prayer life becomes so ineffective. We lack certain things. We lack understanding. We lack faith. We lack time. I had a privilege of discussing this with the pastor one time and some other people. And most of the people, they did disagree with that. <clears throat> I too did it, uh, disagree with that initially, but when we studied it and looked closer into our actions, those ineffectiveness and the lacks came into light. I'll tell you, like, lack of understanding, lack of faith, and lack of time. Lack of understanding. It's mostly like if our prayer life is going to be a ritual, as I told you earlier. It's going to be a ritual because sometime we do the prayer as an obligatory action. Our God is not a God of obligation. Our God is not a God of obligation. Probably other religions and other religious beliefs, they do pray as if it is an obligation. God is not going to have a checkbook and say like, okay, Arun, he did pray in the morning, he did pray in the afternoon, he did pray in the night. No. That's obligation. If I do the prayer as an obligatory action, then it falls into shallow faith, which comes into the second point, lack of faith. We never want to do our prayer as an obligation. We do not want to satisfy our God because of our prayers. And when do we do that? When we don't spend more time with Him. Automatically takes us to the third point, lack of time. <clears throat> we rush in and rush out, as I told you earlier. You should have noticed some point or the other, we have all done that. We always have an agenda at the back of our head, sit down for prayer, recite it, at the back of the mind, there is always a thinking either about your work, or unfinished work, something to do with our finance, with sickness, whatever might be. We just pray, close the eye, open up the prayer by the time Amen, we are done. That's more like an obligatory prayer which brings out lack of understanding, which also brings out shallow faith, which is lack of faith, and we lose up our time with him. That's lack of time. It is so easy for us in this present world affairs that we are more caught up in earthly things. The time we spend with God is becoming less and less but we spend more time with other events. With all these things, we know that we are very, very imperfect. Imperfect in our thoughts, our actions, and emotions, in the sense like our motives. So we learn the way we should pray, how it is to be done, where it is to be done, how far that effective prayer is to be from our Savior, Jesus Christ. So we'll read Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 15. 
Matthew 6, chapter, 5, <clears throat> chapter 6, verse 5 to 15. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their rewards in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who's in, who's unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is a familiar passage for every one of us, and we call that as the Disciples Prayer, or the Lord's Prayer. We call that as the Disciples Prayer because it was the Savior who taught the disciples to pray. That's the reason I say like it's the Disciples Prayer. Though it's the Lord who taught the disciples how to pray. He never prayed it. He need not ask pardon for any of the sins as it comes in the prayer because he sinned not. The disciples asked the Lord teach us to pray. They did not ask God teach us a prayer. Right? So God gave them a model prayer emphasizing on privacy, a purpose, and a pattern. He taught us the motives of the prayer and how to characterize the hearts when we pray. But before he says that, the prayer, he emphasizes certain things, what not to do. We see that in verse 5 and verse 7. Verse 5, I'll read that again. And when you pray, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their rewards in full. Watch that closely. He says, when you pray. He did not say, not if you pray. He said, when you pray. And the you here is a plural you, which is for every other person when you pray. Do not be like the hypocrites. The word hypocrite is a Greek derived word, hypocrisis, which means insincere. Our Savior says there is nothing wrong in practicing our prayer in public. See, we, we pray in churches and 
we gather for a prayer, and whatever we did prior was intercessory prayer. See, God is not condemning that, but he's talking about our motives. It's, our, it's more about our motives. Not to show our righteousness in the public by staging a prayer. We should have seen that in India. Most of us, most of the other religious people, they do it. When they do it in the public, like people would say, wow, wow. All the oohs and the ahs, that's what God says. That's the reward you get at. Those oohs and the ahs and the gasp of breath by the other people are the rewards when we do that. So God is not condemning the practice of righteousness, but never do that in the public. Our Savior here is warning against doing those righteous acts out of unrighteous motives for other people to see and applaud. Those are all temporal things, getting approved from our fellow people. If that be this case, my dear friends, we will never receive the reward from our Father, which is eternal. So beware of our righteous motives, where it is being practiced. You know all, like, our rewards are received in heaven, not on earth. Again, our rewards are based on quality, not quantity. So try to seek your righteousness in secret. Seek your God in privacy. Be still. Listen to him. What he's trying to say to you. We are filled with all the chaos around us. Just imagine like if you want to take an important decision in your workplace. You know, we're discussing an important agenda in your workplace. What do you do? You don't sit and talk with your hierarchy in a chaotic place. You just close the door, sit to discuss, and then come out with some fruitful decisions. If you want to do that for your work, why not you do that with your God? Who is the authoritative person in this world? Why not we do that? Close doors, go in private, meet him, wait for him. Just listen what he's trying to say to you. We'll move to verse 6, where he says, like, where do you pray? To whom you should pray? And how you should pray? Verse 6. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. God says, enter into your private room, single-mindedly, without any distraction, seek his face. Do you have a secret place? Are you spending that secret time with him? Our prayer life, God says, it's, it's more private. The core of our prayer life is not only about privacy. He says it's more secret. It's just two of you alone. You need not worry about the other people. That's what God says, Like not like the hypocrites. They have paid that price. Go into your inner room. What did he mean by that? In those days, they had just one room. We are so privileged and blessed now, like we have more than one room. But in those days, 
just one room. God should have mentioned, like, it's our inner sanctuary, the place of the Spirit. Just go into yourself. Shut yourself from everything. But now you have the privilege of having more one room and just find out which is your room. Either it can be your bedroom, your closet, even your bathroom. Just find out which is the best place for you to be alone with Him. Close all the stimuli. Shut the door. Close your eyes. Shut off all knowledge, things that will bother you with this personal time. Seek Him in privacy. Seek Him in secrecy. Do not put up a show, please. The Lord who is in secret will reward you in secret. We read in Psalm 27, 8, Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me. Answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Just alone with him. I tell you, like, we will reap a lot of things when we have, like, close encounters with him close encounters with him, just with God, just to alone, in secrecy, in private. I will just mention a few, probably we could look into that separately. You seek his divine wisdom, his godly directions. You get a lot of instru- insights into your instructions for your life. personal time, it sharpens your perception. It reveals the log in your eyes. You become less anxious, less in anger, less condemning. That's what we call that as grow more Christ-like. But in spite of all these things, we will never stop sinning. Right? We will not reach that point unless like, we will be taken into heaven one day. But still, we reap all these wonderful things when we spend time with Him alone. Your cleansing place, your cleansing place is always the secret place and you will be rewarded for that. The result of secrecy, you become more sensitive. You become more sensitive. Realize the value of this. Try to build a secret place. Try to spend more time with him. Shut off all things. Our righteousness is developed in secretly. That's why God says, be still and know that I am God. Examine how you do it. And verse 7, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Lord is mentioning more about meaningless repetitions. Meaningless repetitions, vain repetitions. Just look back into our Old Testament in First Kings at Mount Carmel. I think you are all aware of that, right? Baal with 450 prophets and Elijah on Mount Carmel and all the prophets calling upon their Baal God, answer us, answer us. They were shouting from morning till noon. Nothing happened. But when Elijah called on the Lord, Zoom, the fire came, 
it engulfed everything that was drenched in water. So it's not like you need not worry about using the same words, but God is mentioning about pain repetitions. Even our Savior, before his persecution, like, I'm sorry, his crucifixion, he went into prayer three times in Gethsemane. Paul, he pleaded with God three times to take away the thorn. So you can pray like three times, more than three times, doesn't matter. God is not worried about that. But meaningless repetitions, meaningless repetitions and vain repetitions of words. Our prayers can be so simple. God help us. God lead us. God show us. But never do vain repetitions. In verse 8, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Our God is an omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent God. He knows all things, He is all powerful, and He is present everywhere. And He's not going to give a stone when you ask for a bread, a snake for a fish, right? Wait for him. Wait in quietness and stillness because our Heavenly Father cannot lie and he is unchanging. So this is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked him. That has to come true. That has to come true. He knows what we need even before we ask. We can rest confidently knowing that that unchanging God of all creation is taking care of us. Can you remember the last time you spent time with him alone? Remember our secret places become the places not only of cleansing, but it is a place for our survival. The greatest time saver is our prayer. Let's examine ourselves. What is the first thing you do when you wake up? And what is the last thing you do when you go to bed? What occupies our thoughts, our attention throughout each day? Is it communion with God? If not, why not? Why not we do that? Prayer should be the key of the day and the lock of the night. Yes, it should open the day with him and lock as we go to bed, seeking Him. We are awesomely privileged to talk with our Heavenly Father. We are awesomely privileged. In spite of our sin, He is willing to commune with us. He sent His Son, died for us, shed the blood, he rose again. The blood redeemed us from all the sins. And whatever barrier that was in the beginning that has been removed, we have been redeemed and we have been saved by the faith through His grace. What an awesome privilege! This was the thing I was asking you in the beginning. What is that significance? Our prayer is the significance.
significant moment in our Christian life. He has redeemed the sinners with the barrier of sin completely removed. We enter into the deepest possible intimacy with the Holy, Holy, Holy One. Always remember that. Always remember that. You know, the most frustrating thing of all these words like we have been meditating upon, even in prayer, even in this highest possible human act, we can still find a way to bring sin into the picture. Yes, we can still find a way to bring sin into the picture. That's the reason our Savior is warning us. We can do so when we make a show out of our prayer. When we make a show out of our prayer to our merciful, redeeming Father with our sinfully self-centered acts. And when we do that, as I told you, that is not appropriate. That is not appropriate. We will re- be rewarded by earthly people, which is more temporal, which is not what we want. We need to have the eternal crown from God. So I'll close with these suggestions. Whenever we pray, always remember, always remember to whom we are praying. And we are so privileged, so, so privileged to commune with him because of our redemption. And beware of our motivations whenever we need to do our prayer in public. And above all, remember what is so hindering when you're approaching God in privacy. We'll pray. We have missed the perspective of quietness, God. Teach us the perspective. Let us be alone with you so we would learn the insights of our living Lord through your divine wisdom. Let us not be lost into our daily chores. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, for you have redeemed us. Renew us daily, Lord. Teach us to walk humbly in your presence. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Amen.